Thank you for joining us today. We're looking at passages that are worth the dig. By that I mean passages that you can read and you can be benefited by, by reading, but if you dig into them, something profound can happen beyond the first read. And that's what, what I mean by this. So we're digging into certain passages. And this is my third lesson on digging into Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans is a book that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And he wrote it at a critical time for that church. And this is kind of his theme verse. So this is the theme of the book. If I were taking notes in my Bible, Sophia, I would, when I saw those, I would circle that verse and write theme out to the side because that's what it is. It's the theme of the book. Now, here's your introduction for this. When I was in college, one of the ways I helped uh, uh, fund my education, uh, uh, supplement uh, the wonderful help and, and work that mom and dad did to, to enable me to get this degree. Um, one of the things I did is I sold fireworks in the summer. <laughs> now fireworks in Tennessee is serious business. Doug, we had these huge tents that we would sell them in instead of um, boxes. You know, the box is easy. The end of the sales uh, or day, you put the lid down, you lock it, and you go home and sleep in your bed. Oh no. We had tents that were about the size of one of these sections. And that means at the end of the day, you let the flaps down, but you can't go home because you will show up the next morning and have no fireworks. So we had tables in a round or rectangular, um, in a rectangle. <laughs> we had tables in a rectangle with hollowness in the center. And that's where Steve and I slept for two and a half weeks each firework season because we had to stay out there all night and guard the fireworks. Now, the way this tent was set up, that you could come into the beginning, but you were kind of roped off. You couldn't leave until you went all the way around to the cash registers. And we had things set out in sections. So first thing are firecrackers because everybody's coming in to buy firecrackers. So you, they, they can touch them. And you just hand them to them. Say, here, these are your firecrackers. You're going to want those. These will give good. And then after that are the bottle rockets. And the bottle rockets, there are all sorts of different kinds of bottle rockets. And so by doing the booth this way, instead of a booth but a tent, people could hand them. So, I mean, this was salesmanship. This was, here, feel this bottle rocket. Can you feel how heavy it is? That's because it's got a lot of gunpowder in it. And it's going to go up hundreds of feet it's gonna zip now this is called a bumbling bee when this one goes up it zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
that come straight out of the text. And I got more email traffic and more text traffic and more personal visit traffic than I've gotten from a lesson in a long time. And then old Larry Burgess sends me his Facebook page and he says, look at the comments on your lesson from Facebook uh, with this dialogue he's got going. And I didn't have the week and a half it would have taken to read all of the comments. So I did selective reading. I read like the first hour and a half of them. Then I read the last hour and a half of them. And then I just picked four or five hours in the middle to spend all of my day reading on that. Thank you, Larry. And, um, and it occurred to me that I've really struck a nerve here. And it's exciting to me. And so I want to put it together in a nice big package. So if I were describing to you what fireworks are made of, I would tell you, well, there are cardboard tubes for some of them. You've got potassium nitrate or, or some similar gunpowder type explosive. You'll have some more chemicals added for color, for pop, whatever. That's all encapsulated in little shells that are inside the cardboard tubes. And those shells have different shapes and structures and thickness because that will dictate how the explosion may happen up in the sky. Of course, you've got fuses that you have to light just to get the whole thing taken off. But within the framework of all of that, if you do it right, you've got this marvelous chance to have, oh, we had no sound. I worked so hard to have sound on that. we got to do that again. Is there any way to get sound back there? Let's try it again. Ready? Thank you. Thank you. Let's turn the sound way up. These, these, are, these are my fireworks. Yeah. All right. There. That's what I think should happen in your brain and in your heart when you begin to dig deeper and put together all of the pieces like a firework. So that's what I want to do. I want to do that for Romans 1, 16 and 17. And here's what it says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. If you're saying, wait, it says who believes. The verb is pistuo, the noun is pistis. It's the same word in the Greek. It's just a verb or a, uh, a noun. And we have different words that we use in English. So when it's a verb, we translate it believe. When it's a noun, we translate it belief or faith. But we can say, to everyone who believes or to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first, historically it comes to the Jews first, also to the Greek. That's everyone that's not a Jew. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. Quote from Habakkuk. Now, this is, this is it. Let's break it down into some constituent parts. Paul begins, for I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. That word ashamed. Epaiskunomai in the Greek is an interesting word. If we were just going to look it up in the dictionary, you might think it says embarrassed, but it doesn't. There is another Greek word for embarrassed. Paul's not saying, I'm not embarrassed. Paul is saying, I'm not episkunomai. Episkunomai means to experience or this is a definition given in a lexicon, that's more accurate to say, to experience a sense of loss of status because of some particular event or activity. To experience a sense of loss of status. 
epaiskunomai. I'm, Paul says, not experiencing a sense of loss of status because of some particular event or activity. This is not the kind of thing where I feel like I'm less of a person. This is not the kind of thing where I feel like I'm just kind of out there, where I'm a weirdo, where there's something in de it's deficient in me, where I'm just inadequate for some reason, where I'm a third-class spiritual citizen. I don't experience, Paul says, any sense of loss of stature because of some status, because of some particular event or activity. What is that particular event or activity? He tells us, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed. I haven't experienced a sense of loss of status because of the gospel. Because of the euangelion. We spent time on this before, but this is one of the constituent parts of the verse. And you've got to have it all together here today. So the gospel, euangelion in Greek, means a great or a good message or good news. And I ask you, what is Paul's gospel? What is this great message? What does he mean when he uses that word? He makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he said, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the great news I preached to you. The message that's so good. Colon. In other words, here it is. Here is the gospel according to Paul. When Paul speaks of great news, this is what Paul means. Christ died for our sins. In accordance with scriptures, he was buried, he was raised on the third day in accordance with scriptures. That's the gospel for Paul. When Paul uses that word gospel, that's what Paul means. Jesus died for us. The gospel for Paul, don't forget, is the great news that is an historical event. He's not talking about the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, though they bear witness to the historical event. He's saying the great news is an historical event that Jesus Christ died on our behalf and was resurrected to our gain. So when you look at this verse, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What Paul is saying is, I have not experienced a sense of loss of status. Because of Jesus dying for my sins. Doesn't make me less a person. Doesn't make me less in the community. Doesn't make me less in the world. And doesn't make me less before God. That is what he's saying. Now, he says the same thing in other places. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at what he says. This is kind of his theme for a good bit of Corinthians. We preach Christ crucified. What's that? The gospel. The great message. We preach, we deliver a message of Christ crucified. We deliver the gospel. Which is a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. It is a source of shame for them. Paul's not ashamed. It's not a source of stumbling for, for or a loss of status for Paul. Why would it be a stumbling block to Jews? The Jews at the time of Paul, many of the Jews, considered themselves okay with God because of one thing. DNA. 
They were descendants, physical descendants of Abraham. Louis Miori's second favorite Jew is sitting right here on the front row, Rick Meadow, which is sad for Paul and all the other apostles because the first favorite is Jesus. You're second. That pumps you ahead of Paul. Um, but Lewis always tells Rick, there's my second favorite Jew. Now, if Rick were to say, hey, I don't need any issues. I got no issues with God. I'm Jewish. My great, 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 great to the nth degree grandfather was Abraham. The rest of y'all need to figure out what you're going to do with your life. But I'm okay. I don't need anybody to deal with my sins. I, there's nothing that needs to be done with my sinfulness. I'm Jewish. And the idea that I need a Messiah, that's just nothing. It's a stumbling block, a scandalon in the Greek. So the, G, the, the Greeks, by the way, the Gentiles... They had a whole different view. I don't know. Um, we've got such a big audience here. We've got people who watch this on TV and all, uh, on uh, computers. Um, there is a book that came out a long time ago. I don't remember how long ago, but it's by Edith Hamilton. It's entitled Mythology. If you want a good book on what Greeks and Latins believed in their mythology grab Edith Hamilton's book. The first couple of chapters talk about it as ideas. Then after that, she retells many of the stories of Greek and Latin mythology and Roman mythology. So within the framework of that, you can read about the Greek gods. The Greek gods really didn't care that much about most humans. Oh, if you were a particularly attractive woman... Some of the male Greek gods might give you pursuit out of lust. But generally, for most of us, they didn't care that much. They had their own God world going on. And they had to fuss and fight. And Hera had to worry about her husband philandering all the time. By the way, she would take an interest in you if her husband philandered with you. She was very vengeful. Uh, hell hath no fury like a goddess scorned, <laughs> as well as a woman, if I can blend with Shakespeare. So, so uh, uh, you, you've got the gods and the goddesses who are living in their own world and doing their own thing. And the idea that some god is going to be so concerned about humanity... That he's going to want someone innocent to die for sins is absurd. Now that's not to say periodically a God wouldn't be really ticked off and you'd need to kill someone to appease the God. Generally a virgin or a kid. But that was rare and that was just over a circumstance. That wasn't this general idea that everybody needs someone to die for. Them. The gods just really don't care. And the odds are, if you want to get in tight with a god, the best thing to do is to go to one of their temples and pay some money. This is folly, this idea of a Jesus dying for the sins of humanity. It's folly to the Greeks. So Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to Jews. It gets in the way of what they thought was their ticket. And to the Greeks, it just seems like foolishness. But what it is, is the power of God. And the wisdom of God. See, Paul's saying the same thing with different words, but I'm not ashamed. There's no loss of status because of Jesus dying for my sins, the gospel. Because it's the power of God for salvation. It is Christ, the power of God. 
So when you look at that, you realize it's the power of God for salvation. You realize Paul's saying, I've not experienced some sense of loss of status because Jesus had to die for my sins. Because in the death of Jesus, we get the righteousness of God. In the death of Jesus, we get the dikaiosune of God. And this is what I taught on two weeks ago. Dikaiosune is the Greek word that's translated righteousness. It's a profound Greek word, and it should make us say, what is the righteousness that Paul's talking about here? What is this righteousness that's found in the gospel? How are we the righteousness of God? Because Jesus died for our sins. And that's what the passage says. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Well, the word dikaiosune has got two different kinds of meanings. It's got an ethical meaning in, in its main, but, but it's got a judicial meaning as well. A courtroom meaning. And Paul's using it in the judicial courtroom sense. When Paul says that in Christ... The death of Christ. The righteousness of God is revealed. He's talking about the courtroom righteousness. That's not guilty. That's the judge declaring you are set free. You walk out of the court. You are not enslaved because of the court. There is no penalty you have to pay. You are alleviated and declared not guilty. Dikaiosune. And you see the, the word being used this way repeatedly in Scripture. I want to show you John 16, 8 and Acts 17, 31 as two prime examples of dikaiosune referencing this judicial sense of judgment. So if we look at them, 1 John 16, 8. In John 16, 8, Jesus says, let's get this a little bit, there we go, that God's going to send a helper. And when he comes, he will convict, this is the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin. A conviction of sin means a recognition that I'm not adequate. I am not the righteousness of God. I am not the perfection of God. I sin. I sin in my words. I sin in my thoughts. I sin in my deeds, both what I do and what I fail to do. I sin. And I'm convicted of that. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not only convict the world concerning sin, but also dikaiosune. Righteousness. That there's a penalty. There's a consequence for the sin. And that can be a not guilty, dikaiosune, or that can be a judgment. See, Paul continues. He's, uh, not Paul, John, Jesus continues. Concerning sin, because they don't believe in me, what Jesus is saying, Jesus comes to not only convict the world of sin, but to pay the price. Concerning dikaiosune, because I go to the Father, you'll see me no more. The, we have a righteousness that comes to us because Jesus is going to die and go to the Father. And the Holy Spirit will convict us of that. Concerning judgment, because those who are not righteous stand condemned with the ruler of this earth, Satan. So, so, dikaiosune, righteousness, can have this courtroom meaning. And that's what it's got there. That's what it's got in Acts 17, 31. Acts 
In Acts 17, 31, Paul's speaking to the Athenians. And he says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them mocked, but some of them said, we'll listen to you again on this. So Paul went out from their midst. But what is it that they were bothered about? Paul said that God had fixed a day on which he will judge the world in dikaiosune by a man whom he's appointed. And he gave the assurance of this by raising Jesus from the dead. So God is going to judge the world. There will be judgment. It is a courtroom scene. Revelation in that courtroom scene calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. He's the prosecutor. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the parakletos. He's the defense attorney. He's the one called aside to defend. But the defense of the case is rooted in what Jesus did. And the reason, if we go back to the PowerPoint, please, the reason why is because of how God judges. God does not judge you and me unfairly. Doesn't have it in him. Sarah, can't be done. God does not judge unfairly. God doesn't say, well, I'm a little fond of Brittany because she's always sitting on the front row at church. I'm a little fond of that boy she's been bringing with her because he sits with her. And boy, I notice the dad's on the other side of him every Sunday. God doesn't say, uh, I'm going to be extra nice to, to Mel because he's always extra nice to everybody he's around. God doesn't judge unfairly. He doesn't play favorites. He doesn't run some kangaroo court. He can't. God does not have a courtroom with tilted scales. God has a courtroom of justice. God has a courtroom with fairness. When I was a child, I remember thinking, and I didn't get this at home, Mom. I got this uh, at church. And it wasn't that church was saying something bad. Church was talking about how we should be moved in great love and worship because of what Jesus did for us. That's, that's a good thing to teach. But as a kid, and Sophia, I was your age at the time, my thought was this. All right, I'm, I mean, obviously Jesus did a great thing and God did a great thing and I love him and I want to worship him and show him honor and respect. But in the back of my mind was this little nagging voice that said, but really, I mean, he's God. If it was that big of a deal for him to do that, why didn't he just forgive us on his own? Why didn't he just let it skate? I mean, to, to go that extra mile and to do all of that extra and then tell us we should love him because of it? And I did not yet understand that God is a just God. In my mind, God could do anything because he's omnipotent. And I didn't understand, no, there are things that are outside of God's character and God cannot change. God does not change. You say, well, are you saying God's not omnipotent? I'm saying don't play word games. If you think omnipotent means God can do anything, then you're in trouble because how does God create a rock so heavy that God can't lift it? That's not what omnipotent means. So God cannot change who he is. And he is a just God who runs a just court. And the wages of sin are death. Not some sins. Not heavy duty sins. 
Not sins where you get caught. The wages of sin are death. And God has righteousness. So how can God declare me righteous? How can I be the righteousness of God? How can I be? I cannot go back and do it all over again. There is no rewind button that allows me to remove my sin by not doing it. I'm already in deep trouble. I'm already a goner. I'm not sick with sin. Paul said to the Ephesians, you were dead in your trespasses. I'm not sick. This is not, oh, sin is really bad. It's made you ill, spiritually ill. No, I'm dead. As we'd say in Lubbock, D-A-D-E, dead. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm dead. Yet somehow God has given a fair and just judgment of not guilty. How did he do that? How are we the righteousness of God? I gave you three options two weeks ago. I want to remind you of them. I gave you the option of infused grace. That what God has done to make you the righteousness of God is given you grace such that you're able to live morally and righteously. That, that view is not biblical. And, and I don't ever want to group people together because any time you group, you're not being fair. If I tell you every, um, and then put in any group, is A, B, or C, I'm not being fair. Generally. So I, I don't want to say every, but I, and, and I don't want to offend and upset anybody. But historically, this has been a view that was espoused for a long time in the Catholic Church. we got a lot of folks who come to this class and watch this that are Catholic. Again, that's not all Catholics. In fact, there are a great many marvelous Catholic theologians who do not teach this. But it's historically been a view that's seen most often within the Catholic Church. That God has infused grace and so there are these moments where you touch the grace of God and that has made it possible for you to be moral and righteous and if you live right, you'll be the righteousness of God. That's not what Paul is saying. You and I can't do that. We're not going to measure up. As good as we can be, as all the grace there is, we're never going to be able to measure up. That's option three. Option two is the one, I got one person that talked to me about option three. Option two is the one that I got inundated with and had marvelous dialogues with some splendid people who have a heart for the Lord and a mind for godliness. But option two is one that sounds right but needs to be examined because by itself, it is not the gospel. It's the idea that God imparts righteousness to us or imputes, is a Reformation word, righteousness to us. In other words, God gives the believer the righteousness that Jesus has. So you're declared not guilty because Jesus was righteous and God's going to give you his righteousness. Now I believe God gives us the righteousness of Jesus, but that's not the gospel. That's not the core. This sounds really nice because it recognizes our dependence upon Jesus. But that is not the gospel. And if somebody wants to fuss about it, then they're not really fussing with me. They're fussing with Paul. This is the illustration that was used by, by my professor, Dr. Floyd. I just loved. He said, 
Now, this is, we're in Tennessee, remember. He said, uh, he said, imagine that you go out into the meadow. And the meadow is one that is inhabited by cows. <laughs> and in this meadow of cows have been left residue. There are cow chips that have been left in the meadow. And that is human with sin. And the idea that God just imputes the righteousness of Jesus is much like the idea of snow falling on the meadow to cover up the cow chips. And you can look and say, oh, it's so beautiful, it's so clean, it's so perfect. But really what it is, is snow covering up a bunch of cow chips. The idea that it's clean and pure and perfect is a fiction. A surface fiction. When you dig into it, you see it's based on a fiction. And God's righteousness is not based on a fiction. It's based on reality, the truth. God doesn't simply say to us, I'm going to give you, Hank, the righteousness of Jesus. I know you've got sin. Your wife has told me all about it. <laughs> she has given me great details. But praise God, it's going to snow on your sin and nobody's going to see it. <laughs> what God says, the righteousness of Christ is different. It's option number one. It says we're not guilty. We are righteous because the price for the sin has been paid. It's done. It is finished. Tetelestai, Jesus cried from the cross. It is over. The price has been paid. The meadow was cleaned up before the snow came. You have the righteousness of Christ, but more importantly, you have the cleaning, the redemption that comes from His blood. He has paid the price for your sins. Because God cannot, God cannot simply look the other way with your sin. It's okay that you have sinned. You come and be into my bosom because I'm going to give you the righteousness of Christ. And so I'll take all of your sin anyway. No. It's the wages of sin or death. And I'm going to pay the price and die the death on your behalf. So that you are clean. You're clean. The price for your sin has been paid. Look, God is a just God. He requires justice. And we know that. One of the most fun things I've ever gotten to do in my life is, is spend time with now deceased Judge Justice Antonin Scalia uh, from the Supreme Court. And he and I were fishing one time uh, in, uh, on this little two-man boat in the bayous of Louisiana. And we spent a lot of time talking theology. He was a very devout man, Catholic. I said to him, I said, Justice, I said, I, I don't see where you get purgatory. Now, if you don't know, purgatory is the belief that when you die, if you're a saint, you get to like go straight up. But if you're ordinary uh, and, and you've been infused with grace, then you're going to go to purgatory where you're going to spend some unknown amount of time that God decides paying for the sins. And that's what he told me. He said, look. God's got mercy. He's taken us to heaven. But even with mercy, there must be justice. He says there's got to be purgatory. He says, I don't understand how you could not believe in purgatory. Because somebody's got to pay the price for your sins. Oh, but somebody did. Oh, but somebody did. 
In Matthew chapter 16, Matthew tells about when Jesus and, and his followers were coming uh, on a journey down from the north. And, and Jesus asks them, um, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, uh, you're the son of God, the Messiah, the Savior, Yeshua, HaMashiach. You, you are, you're the one. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. That you, you didn't figure this out on your own. Heaven's revealed this to you. And then you have this passage in Matthew 16, 21. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. Matthew 16, 21. Now, we can read that quickly and lose the import of the word I've put in red. But you see that word that Jesus said. He must go to Jerusalem. Jesus had to die for sins. Jesus had to do it. There wasn't another way. There wasn't a plan B. And what's more is what Paul explained in Romans 3, 24 through 26. Paul explained Abraham had God's righteousness, dikaiosune. Abraham had the righteousness of God by faith. And as one of my buddies in class who was emailing back and forth with me trying to look through this and chart it through the scriptures, and we came upon the, the, the Romans 3 passage. Look at this. Now, the dikaiosune, the righteousness of God, has been manifested. It's been shown. God's righteousness has been shown. His declaration of not guilty. God's not guilty has been shown apart from the law. The law makes you guilty. Under the law, we're all guilty. Wages of sin, death. But God's not guilty has been manifested apart from the law, even though the law, the Torah, and the prophets bear witness to it. They talk about it. This dikaiosune, this not guilty, this righteousness of God through faith to every, in Christ Jesus, to all who have faith, no distinction, everyone has sinned. Everyone has fallen short of God's glory, but are, and that justified word is off the same root as dikaiosune, are declared not guilty by His grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And then look what Paul says. Paul says this was to show God's dikaiosune, God's not guilty. Fair, just not guilty. Because in God's divine patience, he passed over former sins. It was to show his dikaiosune, his not guilty at the present time, so he could be just, he could be fair, and the justifier of those who have faith. What Paul is saying is, Jesus had to die if for no other reason than God was forgiving Abraham. But someone had to pay the price for Abraham's sin. God can't simply say, I'm going to let that slide. That's not the cosmic existence of justice. So that, that's not what we've got. So we go back, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For in the death of Christ. I'm not a, I haven't experienced a sense of loss of status because Jesus died for my sins. Because in the, the, the death of Christ is the righteousness, the, the dikaiosune, the not guilty of God revealed. We see it. It's revealed the not guilty that applied to Abraham. The not guilty that applies to a five-year-old kid who dies and goes to the Lord. 
Why? Because Jesus paid the price for that five-year-old kid's sin. Jesus has paid the price for the sin. So Paul is saying here, I haven't experienced a sense of loss of status because of Jesus dying for my sins. Jesus dying for me is God's righteous, sorry about the end there, God's righteous way to declare me not guilty. I mean, that's like the fireworks. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel, the death of Christ on my behalf, with my sins, the death of Christ in substitution for me is God's power to save everyone who believes. It's the power of God and the wisdom of God, as Paul said to the Corinthians. God has figured out a way to merge His mercy and His justice. Who knows the song, Beneath the Cross of Jesus? Okay, seven people. You need to know that song. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. A hope within the wilderness, a rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. I take, O cross, thy shadow, thy shelter, as my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by to know no gain or loss, my sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. O oh, safe and happy shelter, O oh, refuge tried and sweet, O oh, trysting place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. As to the holy patriarch, that wondrous dream was given. So seems my Savior's love to me, a ladder unto heaven. I, that's what this is. This, this is nothing less than the supreme judge of the supreme court in the universe telling everyone who has faith in his son, you are not guilty. Not as a word game, not as a semantic game, but as a true, real fact, because the price for every sin you've committed has been paid in full. Amen. And that is why Paul can say, I haven't experienced a sense of loss of status because of Jesus dying for my sins. It's what's given me the status I have. It's the power of God to save everyone who believes. It may be a stumbling block. It may be folly. But it's the righteousness of God. It's the power of God. It's the Sophia of God. It's the wisdom of God. It is, the, it is what God has done in a historical event. And that is the great message. And it comes to those who have faith. Which I want to talk to you about in more detail in a couple of weeks. <laughs> so ignore these slides. We're out of time. But for now, when you dig into this verse... I sure hope you experience what I do, and that is just because that's worth the dig. Here's, here's your go-home message, and then we'll pray us out. If you are someone who is burdened by your sin, I have great news for you. 
I have great news that Jesus Christ has paid for the price of those sins and you need be burdened no more. His yoke is easy. And he wants to take the weight of those sins off of you because he's already carried them. And when you trust him with that, you've got the righteousness of God. You say, yeah, well, I sort of have, but I still sin. I'm still mixed up in a bunch of junk. Oh, yeah, he's probably got a lot of cleanup work to do with many of us, okay? But the God who has declared us not guilty has promised to complete this good work he began in us. And so he's going to clean us up. And you can, you can experience remorse, and you should experience remorse and regret over sin. But there's a difference between that and suffering the guilt of shame and, and despair. Because we have won the battle by putting our trust in Jesus who defeated sin on the cross by paying the price in full. It's not a fake justice. It's not a surface justice. It's genuine. You can be as guilty as sin, and that's okay because the price for the guilt to sin has been redeemed, paid. Now, there are some people who are dwelling in the midst of this, and, and you understand what God has done for you and you rejoice and you're thankful and you're moved in love and deep respect and appreciation. And for those who hear this message, I hope that this is just a amen that you, you shout emphatically in your soul. And then there may be some who are listening or come across this message who've never really walked into that relationship with God. Some who are saying, I, I, need, I, need, I need this. Um, don't be embarrassed, but don't be ashamed. There's no loss of status. We all need it. And it's not hard to get. It's just a matter of trusting in the Lord. It's a matter of coming to Him and just acknowledging Lord, I'm not even sure that I understand it all. But I know that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness and that Jesus has died for my sins. I'm going to have to trust that because I got nothing else. There may be another category of people who just say, well, that message doesn't apply to me. I'm a good person. Which camera? Show me the camera. Which one's on me? It's that one? No. That one? <laughs> God will bring the proud to their knees. Amen. Let me bless you in the name of Jesus. Father, as a class of folks who've been bought with the blood of Jesus who stand forgiven of sins with the penalty paid in full I say thank you Father I put my faith and I put my trust in you and in the forgiveness of your son that's how we pray to you. That's how we seek you out. That's how we live with something other than a fatalistic view of this world. We live with the hope and confidence that the one who bought us and delivered your righteousness to us will be coming back to take us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.